So, be Welcome to the Immigration.ca live stream series. My name is Andrea, and I'm here with immigration lawyer Colin Singer. Colin is managing partner of Immigration.ca. Our main topic of discussion today will be occupations that are eligible for an application under Express Entry. Before we get started, we're just going to quickly touch on the latest Express Entry draws. So the last Express Entry draw was actually yesterday, March 1st. So Colin, scores are at an all-time low of 434, and it's been the maximum amount of, of uh, invitations. invitations. So yeah, it's, a, it's the third Express Entry draw uh, in the past three weeks. Um, yesterday's draw, March 1st, had 3,334 invitations. We've seen declining CRS scores. Yesterday was 434. We had a draw one week before on February 12th, 3,611 invitations. The CRS score was a bit higher at 441. And two weeks prior to that, February 8th, uh, well over 3,500, 3,664 invitations. Uh, the CRS score was 447. So we're seeing uh, successive declines in the CRS scores over the past three weeks. 10,609 invitations. So we're well on our way to seeing uh, a, a really a record number of invitations this year. And if we, if we do a bit of an, uh, an extrapolation, uh, we've done two months, just about two months of uh, draws. We've had six draws this year. And if we just multiply that over the full year, we're looking at well over 110, 115,000 invitations. And I mean, it, it seems like uh, obviously a high number compared to last year's 32,000 invitations. And again, we've talked about this before. Um, the main reason why the government needs uh, to issue so many invitations is this drop-off factor. Uh, where uh, people don't perfect their applications uh, and, and submit full applications within the 90 days. So they, they need to, to reach high in order to get 72,700 uh, landings, uh, permanent residents under the economic class uh, for 2017. So this is great news for those who are in the express entry pool who would, or who, those who would like to apply under express entry because obviously we are seeing a trend of more invitations and lower scores. Uh, declining scores and again uh, you know for those that are on the cusp of, of a 434 CRS score uh, you know you 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 need to be it's 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 not easy to just go and improve your language abilities of course that's uh, obviously when we've talked in the past how can I improve my CRS score we've talked about improving your education or improving your language right. but of course the 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 uh, a preferred uh, way of, of addressing uh, uh, your, your CRS score, obviously, is getting employment in Canada. Right. And we assist our, our clients with employment search assistance as well. So you know, the extra 50 points that you could be getting from finding a job in Canada could be the necessary amount of points that you need it to is. qualify. It is. it is very encouraging for people who are in the uh, 370s and 380s uh, and who need a boost of 50 points, uh, all our clients are receiving uh, search consulting uh, assistance where we're providing our clients with 500 uh, employers in Canada. We, we provide... Uh, we assist with their CV as well, and right. cover letter assistance, as well as other important tools when applying for a job, or in, as well in the interview process as well. That's it. So uh, how to get through to employers? Uh, what we've always said uh, up till now is applying online, going to online job boards. Anyone who's directing you to online job boards, it's the weakest form of employment search. It's the weakest strategy you could be taking. Uh, what you want to be doing is a proactive job search. You want to be working with a professional right. who, can, who can give you some insight on how to stand out from others in the crowd. When you're using an online job board, all you're doing is going into what we call a beauty contest uh, where you, know, you, you can't gauge your chances of success. You're competing against many other people. Right. But with our assistance, we like to believe that we help our clients stand out and those uh, who are successful uh, are getting employment and, and those 50 points for many of them, not to mention having a job in Canada lined up uh, is obviously very comforting. So uh, really good news ahead in terms of what to expect. We're seeing healthy numbers and I don't, of course we can't predict the future, but it doesn't, given the metrics that we've, we've talked about, 
it doesn't look like this is going to change. The, the, right. the future looks very promising for this year. Uh, candidates who uh, are interested in coming to Canada under the express entry system, uh, uh, now is an excellent time to be moving forward. Perfect. That's great. I mean, this also ties in nicely with our main topic. Should we just start? Discussing? Why not? Let's okay. go. So our main topic discussion is occupations that qualify for an application under express entry. So when submitting an application to the express entry pool, obviously one of, the, one of the criteria is you need to have one year full-time paid work experience in the past 10 years, and this has to be under one of the qualifying occupations. So to determine whether, should we discuss how? Well, yeah, I mean, broadly speaking, obviously if you're looking at express entry, uh, there's three categories, well, there's four main programs. Uh, either you're in the Canadian experience class, you're in the federal skilled worker program, or the federal skilled trades, as well as many uh, provincial nomination programs, the provincial programs, have pro are participating in the express entry system. So your, your, your employment occupation, the, the occupation that you choose, that you are going to go in under, it's, it's critical. Uh, so what we'd like to uh, share with you today is we're going to pretty well talk about the two larger uh, programs, the Federal Skilled Worker Program and the Federal Skilled Trade. So let's talk about the Federal Skilled Worker Program. Uh, when you're going to look to an occupation that you obviously, uh, hopefully, have uh, the, the credentials for, uh, you need to have one year of continuous full-time paid work experience during the previous 10 years. Yes. Uh, and, and if you're going to be in the federal skilled trades, you need two years of continuous full-time. It has to be paid. And, you know, we see a lot of people who uh, can consider that they have the right employment experience, but it's not paid. Right. So this, this becomes an obstacle for many individuals. If you're doing an internship and you're not being paid, uh, or if you're doing any volunteer work, uh, unfortunately, that's not going to cut it, and it's not going to meet uh, the minimum requirements. Now, let's talk about the tool we, we, we like to show everybody uh, that, that we're using, and, and it's very useful. Okay, so this is the National Occupational Classification. So Colin is holding a link, so if you would like to check it out. So basically, you enter your there's a, there's a search bar, and you can enter in your occupation, and then you'll get a list, and then you can actually browse through occupations that might that would actually meet your 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 your, your job description so as we mentioned uh, you need to have one year continuous full-time work experience in the past 10 years and when you go on this link you'll also under your occupation you're also going to see a list of duties so you need to have completed at least 70 percent of these duties as well well yeah I mean the the case law in the past has has uh, required that candidates uh, show a majority of, of the lead statement uh, and the main duty. So when you use the tool we just showed you, you're going to be able to search for your occupation. And when you see uh, a number of choices, obviously we, we, we encourage people to, uh, to move around in the range of occupations uh, that come up uh, that sound similar. Uh, when you find the best occupation, you're going to see uh, a lead statement for, let's say, you're a nurse. If you're a registered nurse, you're going to have a, a lead statement. Mm -hmm. And the, the lead statement and the duties combined, you want to be, in a perfect sense, of course, in, in a sense that uh, to, to have a, a strong application, you want 70% uh, of your duties and the lead statement covered uh, in terms of what you do uh, against the descriptions that are uh, being used to gauge uh, whether you, uh, in fact, f fulfill the requirements for that occupation. Exactly. Yes. So uh, the, the, the test really is, is not ingrained in stone. No. Uh, we obviously are going to work with people who don't have the full, uh, you know, uh, every single detail. It's the majority. It's certainly, again, we try to use a number of 70%. Right. Now, you'll also find on that descriptive... For example, licensing requirements. The, the employment requirements relating to licensing and education. So you'll be able to, to, to look at that tool, find your occupation, and you'll be able to gauge uh, whether you have uh, the minimum education. Now, uh, they often use words like usually. Uh, they, they describe occupational requirements in terms of may 
or usually uh, perform or usually have a, a degree. So which, when, when they use words that may or usually, uh, it's not essential. Uh, but there are some occupations where the essential requirement is a bachelor's degree, for example. So if you uh, have acquired uh, the ability to perform a particular occupation, but you don't have the education, that these are, these are obstacles that we uh, work with, uh, with, our, with our clientele to overcome sometimes, not always. Uh, so these, these are really important. Now, let's talk about the, the large groups of, okay. of, the, of categories and unit groups. Okay, so say if you're applying under Express Entry, your occupation must fit under NOC A, B, or 0. These are the categories. So NOC 0, these will be managerial occupations, for example. Uh, NOC A, uh, those that fit under the, the group A would be occupations that require a university degree, usually. Usually. Mm -hmm. And then there's finally B, and these occupations require maybe a one or two year diploma, a college diploma, maybe some apprenticeship, that kind of... That Those are the like, like skilled trades occupations. Obviously, uh, you're going to have candidates who've, who've, who've completed a, a vocational program, not, all, not always, but often, mm -hmm. And they will have done uh, an apprenticeship. Yes. So those those would, those types of occupations you'll find under NOC B categories. Uh, the NOC A categories are occupations uh, like the engineers, the the professionals, the um, management uh, um, uh, personnel who are lower management. Uh, of course, higher management, mid management, and higher. Uh, the the uh, NOC will start with a zero. Yes. Uh, and so this particular tool uh, tries to encompass uh, the broad disciplines of, of employment and what you want to stay away from, unfortunately, if you're a candidate who's going to be performing a job in a C category or a D category, uh, these, are, these are lower types of, of positions. For example, if you're a clerk, uh, if you're a sales clerk yes. uh, in, a, in a retail setting, uh, unfortunately, this, may, this will not qualify for express entry uh, for a federal skilled worker program. It won't qualify for a uh, the federal skilled worker program. It may qualify occasionally. You'll see candidates with uh, occupations in the C range. Very little, very few will qualify in the D range. But there are candidates in the C range, for example, and, and they'll qualify not under express entry, but they'll qualify under a provincial program, a particular province has a shortage of certain types of occupations. For example, where we're very active is long-haul trucking. Yes. So a long-haul trucking position will have an NLC classification of C, and that you won't qualify for express entry, but you'll have to come to Canada first uh, on a work permit, and then ultimately you'll be going in uh, under a provincial uh, pilot project, and we've covered this on our website. But back to the point, uh, the three broad groups, uh, the broad uh, categories are, are, are O, A, and C. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, <laughs> O, A, and B. Now, uh, on our site, we have a list of what we've, con what we've combined, 347 occupations. Yeah. So you can always go to the website to see to check out the list to see where you fit in. Under the skill, under the eligible uh, federal skilled worker occupations on our website, we we've actually gone through the entire NOC code, and we've come up with 347 federal skilled occupations, plus the federal skilled trades. Uh, that's the primary occupation. So what we haven't done is included all the secondary occupations uh, that you'll find in, in a main occupation because actually it's, it's well more than 347 occupations. But in terms of primary occupations, go to our website under the uh, eligible, eligible occupations yes. and you'll see our list of, and then you can use that tool uh, that we've just described earlier, the, uh, the tool which is the... The website for the NOC. Right. So, um, in terms of, let's, I just wanted to go over, I think what we want to talk about is some major points, major okay. tips uh, that people are um, uh, needing to keep in mind. Okay, so, so, let's talk about completing, you know, your work history. When you're going into the express entry pool... You must give a complete description of your work history in that specific occupation under which you're applying. 
And in terms of disclosing, you know, the, your best work experience, you know, in other yes. words, you don't, you don't need to cover everything going into the express entry pool. At a later date, then, once you get your invitation to apply for permanent residence, then you need to give your full employment history, either from the age of 18 or if that's not applicable, from the past 10 years. So you can choose, if, you, if you've got a, a rich background and uh, perhaps the past uh, six years or eight years is, is, has been the bulk of your uh, qualifying experience, you, you don't want to necessarily put all your experience in the profile that you're uploading to the Express Entry Pool. Yes. Uh, and go with your main uh, experience. Yes. Of course, you'll have to put in later on, uh, if we're uh, able to, to receive an invitation, mm -hmm. uh, the candidates will then have to uh, declare their entire work history uh, and education since age 18, or if they don't have, uh, if it doesn't apply, uh, then just the past 10 years. Right. Uh, I think what we also want to let everyone know is work experience that doesn't qualify. Right, so say you're applying under the CEC, which is the Canada Experience class. You're full, you, have, you need to have one year full-time Canadian work experience, but this must be completed after you graduate. So, for, for example, say you, you start your work experience while you're still studying, that wouldn't, that wouldn't count. It would only count from after you graduated. Also, uh, it, with regards to other experience that might not, if you're self-employed, for example. Self-employed experience won't count, unfortunately. Those who are on a subcontracted basis who, who are not really working for one employer, it's a bit of a, a problem for, for individuals who have that kind of a, a structure in their employment uh, uh, history. Uh, I'll, again, we, we talk about full-time studies. If you've got work experience while you're a full-time student, unfortunately, that is not going to count. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, it's unfortunate that they draw the line somewhere, and this is one of the areas where uh, people don't have. But there's another area that we want to let people know uh, we see, of course, when we're preparing an application, we're helping uh, our clients secure uh, uh, the, the, the proof of employment experience. Uh, and this is the most important part of an one of the most important parts of an application. And what you don't want to be doing is going to your employer, opening up the NOC uh, code that applies to your occupation, and asking the employer to give you your reference letter uh, that pretty much uh, copies, copies or plagiarizes the NOC description. Uh, we see many people doing that. Uh, unfortunately, what you want to do and what we do is we don't write employment letters, of course not, no. we can't do that, but we give you good insight on, on what you should include and what you shouldn't be doing. And I think what we do see occasionally are people producing letters that clearly were uh, copy and paste from the NOC uh, tool and this will raise uh, red, flag. red flags. It, yes. it does. Yes. Uh, so you may have gotten an invitation, uh, and now you're, you're uploading some of your other experience and, 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 and such. And when you're, when you're putting together your employment letters that unfortunately replicate the NLC code, uh, this, this is really something that, that is, is not advisable. So part of what we do is we work with our clients in making sure that the proof of employment experience is going to is going to work yes. uh, in terms of uh, not uh, running afoul with what we were just saying up. Uh, so again, uh, what we want people to do is check out our federal skilled worker program eligible occupations. It's on our website. Uh, we've covered the 347 primary occupations in the federal skilled worker category, as well as the uh, federal skilled trades. Um, I think that, did think you that, want to cover anything else? I think that, pretty, that covers everything for our main topic today. If you're interested in coming to Canada, please do go to our website, immigration.ca, and you can complete our free online evaluation form. We'll then evaluate your options and we'll get back to you. We also we provide our clients with immigration assistance as well as employment search assistance as well. And for our next live stream, please follow us on Facebook. It'll be in the next two weeks, so we'll keep you posted. And you can always follow us on social media. Well, definitely what we want people to do is like us on Facebook uh, if, you have that, if you haven't already done so. Uh, I can say uh, we can confirm our next live stream is going to be two Thursdays from today. Uh, so that's March the 16th, 11 a.m. 
Uh, we're going to continue on our discussion from today. Uh, it's going to be part two. Uh, we'll let you know what the topic is, some really important elements uh, on the employment side. Uh, so follow us on Facebook uh, and stay in touch with us and uh, pretty much. Pretty much, and we'll see you in the next live stream. Thanks for joining us. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.